rejoice and all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in love and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age. Beginning at the end, the Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb, how great is our God.
and sovereign o'er the land. Nations bow at his command, singing the correct answer yeah. which was we all are because the bible suggests that in the world cup all the teams compete but only one receives the prize Woo. a trophy that will not last but we live this life and we are here today to get the ultimate prize a crown that will last forever let's pray yeah. father we are very grateful that we can sit in your beautiful sunshine that you've made to warm the earth. We're grateful that we can sit in your incredible presence that warms our soul. We pray that today, Father, as we enjoy the fellowship, as we enjoy worshiping you, as we enjoy learning from your word and be re being reminded about Jesus, that our minds will not be on how well will England do in the World Cup, but our minds will be on how well will our soul do in winning that ultimate prize. We pray, God, that you will please come into our lives deeply and richly, Father, so that we may know you better, so that we can serve you more and walk with you more deeply. Thank you, God, for this beautiful day. We pray that it will be to your glory and to your praise, Father, on that incredible day where we will all get to see you and be with you and be crowned with that crown of righteousness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
uh, it's wonderful to be here today just to be able to share communion together. Communion's a time where we get to really connect with and be in touch with both the forgiveness and the power of an amazing God. Um, we're going to take, as Malcolm said, bread and wine from our cups. Um, the bread symbolizes a body that was shattered for us. The wine symbolizes the blood that was poured out for us. And of course, it's tempting to feel it's all a little bit religious and all a little bit familiar. But the challenge for us, I think, is to really relate to what Jesus did for us, given we live in such a blessed time. I heard some statistics recently, and I, I shared them with, with, with some guys. And the first one is that we are actually now the first generation that is more likely to die from old age globally than infectious diseases. So we're kind of winning that battle. However, even in a blessed environment like that, where science and technology and so many things can help us, there are still challenges. We're also the first generation that is more likely globally, not just in a particular country, but globally, to die of overconsumption of food and the diseases and illnesses that come with that than starvation. And I've got one to share with you as well, which is heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. And that is that we are the first generation, globally, who is more likely to die from suicide than war, crime, and terrorism wrapped up together. We live in a paradise gone wrong, and we need God. Uh, even the Apostle Paul, a great man of faith, knew this. He had a thorn, the Bible says. He had a real problem, a real challenge. And he cried out for, to God in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect through weakness. You see, our challenges aren't perhaps on a global scale, but they're real to us. And maybe our consciences needs some help. We've seen things, we've watched things, we've said things, we've thought things that we know we need forgiveness for. Perhaps there are things in our lives that have such a power over us that we're ashamed we can't stop them. Again, mentally, physically, emotionally, relationally. And the communion is a time where we get to connect with a great God and say, God, in your strength this can happen. We can be raised from the dead. In my own strength I can do nothing. And so, as we come to pray now for the, to, before we take the bread and wine, I ask us to really humble ourselves. Be honest with ourselves. Do our consciences need forgiving? And do our lives need need the power of God. Let's pray. Dear God, Father in heaven, thank you so much that your grace is sufficient for us. That no matter who we are, what we've done, what we've seen or thought or said, our forgiveness is guaranteed through Jesus as long as we accept the relationship with him. God, thank you so much that your power is made perfect through weakness. There's not one of us, God, who is a superhero. We all need your strength, God, to live the lives that you want us to live and to be the friends, the fathers, the mothers, the brothers, the sons, the daughters, the sisters, God. We, we all need your strength. Help us to be real about that, God. And please, Father, as you take the bread and the wine today, help us to really ask you for your help and trust that you will give it to us. We love you, God, and we're so grateful for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Your blood, it speaks a better word than all the empty claims. 
gathered upon this earth Speaks righteousness for me Stands in my defense Jesus, it's your blood Your blood Speaks a better word Than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth Speaks righteousness for me Stands in my defense Jesus, it's your blood What can wash away our sins And what can make us whole again Nothing but the blood Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can wash us pure as snow And welcomed as the friends of God Nothing but the blood Nothing but your blood, King Jesus Your cross, it testifies in grace Tells of the Father's heart To make a way for us Now boldly we approach not by earthly confidence It's only by your blood And what can wash away our sins And what can make us whole again See nothing but the blood Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can wash us pure as snow And welcomed as the friends of God Nothing but your blood Nothing but your blood King Jesus What can wash away our sin? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can wash us pure as snow? Welcomed as the friends of God Nothing but your blood Nothing but your blood King Jesus It's your blood, it's your blood What I'd like to talk about is, and again, we're, I, I'm sorry if you're not into the World Cup or if your team isn't in the World Cup, Oh. but but I, I would like to maintain that theme for just a little bit longer and entitle this brief lesson, How to Win the Cup. We'd all love to know how to win the Cup, and a lot of nations would indeed as well. Uh, and there have been a lot of standout moments so far in this World Cup. Um, but personally speaking, as an Englishman, Germany leaving the tournament has been the highlight, and I don't care what else happens from now on. So I'm really sorry if you're German, but you've had a really good long run, okay? So don't, be, don't begrudge me my moment. Now, I've got a qu few questions for you about the World Cup, and the first question is only to be answered by people under the age of 13. So that does exclude you, Ben Dannett. <laughs> Under the age of 13 only for this first question. 
how many teams are taking part, have been taking part in this year's World Cup. You put your hand up and I'll call on you. Do you know? 32. How did you know that? That is the correct answer. You get a football delivered specially for you by Jude Makinson. One football for EVA. 30, how did she know 32? I didn't know 32 until I looked it up. That's impressive. You didn't whisper in her ear, did you, Dad? No, well, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Okay, question open to anybody, but it has to be a hand up. I'm not taking shouted answers. If you shout, you ain't getting asked. Uh, ain't getting to answer. Okay, let's see. How many times has the World Cup been played since it began? Including this tournament, how many times? How many World Cups? Not you, Dad. You've already got your daughter's already got something. Rob, 21 is the correct answer for Rob McKenzie. If football will be delivered, can you kick it into the space? I'll kick it. Come on, Jude's gonna kick it. We want you to keep mind the camera. Mind your heads, everybody. Okay. All right, that goes over to Rob McKenzie over there. 21 tournaments have been played, including this one. Only two have been missed during the Second World War and just after. Right, ah, okay, another question. Ah, okay, here's a good one. All right. Again, anybody can answer, but it has to be a hand up. Up to this point, at least, what is the name of the World Cup's oldest goal scorer? The name of the World Cup's oldest goal scorer, at least so far. You might have to be a little older than some of us here to remember, but do we have a hand at the back there? Roger Miller is the correct answer. Excellent. Can we deliver a ball back there, Jude? Kicking it into the space. It's reasonable accuracy here. Roger Miller. Do anybody know how old he was? Roger Miller when he scored that goal for Cameroon? Older than 40. 42, someone said. Actually, Many believe he was a quite a bit older than that because no one ever found his birth certificate. But uh, never mind. He played for Cameroon. That was in uh, against Russia in 1994. Okay, third question, I think. Is that right or fourth? Third. Third question. Okay, let's see. All right. This is one for the, for the statisticians and the nerds who love numbers and things like that. Which country, up until this point in World Cup history, has had the most draws in the World Cup? What country would you predict would have the most draws in the World Cup, at least up until this point. No, it's not England. We haven't been in enough games um, over the years. Danny? Not Poland, no. Russia. Not Russia. Spain. Not Spain. Spain. Not France. Let me go over this way. Italy. Italy is the correct answer. Wow. One ball for Roger Peckham. 21 draws in World Cups. We got one left? Okay, one left. Let's see. Let me pick a good question for this last one. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, what, I tell you, I, I, which country scored the most goals in one game in World Cup history? Which country? Oh, a lot of hands up here. Let's go over there at the back. Not Germany, who's next to you? Did you have your hand up? No? Okay, we're going to go back there? Not the Netherlands, no, we're going to go there? Not Brazil, over there, in the England shirt? I can't hear what you're saying? No, not you, in the England shirt back there? I don't think so, if I can hear you correctly. We're going through the countries now. A few more countries. Argentina. Not Argentina. Russia. Not Russia. Portugal. Not Italy. Uruguay. Uruguay, not Uruguay. No. No. Belgium. No. No. Not Spain. Not Portugal. Far back there. Not Switzerland. Not France. Pardon? I can't hear you. Not Uruguay. Where? Not Belgium. Yes, what was that? What were you going to say? No, Brazil. Okay, I'm going to have to give you a clue. England. You think you know over there? No, the Netherlands. No. No Googling it, by the way. No. 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 I thought we'd get it by now. This is taking forever. Okay, I'm going to give you a clue. Mexico. I'm going to give you a clue. 
European country. Narrow it down to one we haven't already mentioned, Ian. Croatia. No, not England. Croatia. Croatia, no. Not Greece. <laughs> Ben gets a football. Ben had to be Ben Oh my goodness, that was. What was the score? Anybody know how many goals they scored? They scored ten against the unhappy El Salvador. Ten-one was the score in that game. Oh my word, that that was exhausting. Nah. I know it's hot, but I need to sit down. Um, here's the thing. The World Cup's a fantastic thing, whether you're into it or not. It's a great event, and millions and billions watch it. I would say this. I think being alive, just having life, is like you've already got into the World Cup. I mean, you think about the precious things that we have in life, friendships and special occasions and special uh, events that happen and things that give us joy and pleasure. I mean, we really have arrived, especially, let's, let's face it, us sitting here. I mean, so many people and so many parts of the world just don't have what we have. We really have it made here, this sunshine. I mean, aren't we glad it's not raining today, as it has done on some other occasions. And we're sitting here complaining about the possible sunstroke and heat, but the truth is, it's a glorious day. We've got lots of lovely food lined up for us. We've had a good sing-song. We're seeing a lot of our old friends. I mean, we, it's like we're in the World Cup. And life is amazing. Even if we didn't have all this, life is a precious gift. It's like you're in the World Cup. You've kind of made it. But here's the thing. The thing about going to the World Cup is not just going. It's, it's about winning. It's about... It's about getting something special out of it. And we want to win, and I know most of us here, I'm sure, we don't want to just get through life. We want to wring everything out of it we can. We want to get the most out of it. It ne needs to mean something, our lives, rather than just exist. And part of that is the spiritual side of life. A fulfilled life cannot include an absence of spiritual meaning. A life with meaning can't have an absence of spirituality. Even those without faith in God would agree with this, most people. The spiritual component is vital if we're going to find meaning in our special, amazing lives. And therefore we have to question ourselves as to why so often we prioritize the material over the spiritual. Some of us here recently graduated from university. I know Alex Clegg is feeling a great sense of relief at having finished his university studies and is looking forward to a summer of freedom. Possibly job hunting, I don't know. And I remember that moment. It was quite a long time ago for me when I uh, graduated. Um, but the story is told of the, gra the chap who was graduating, who was called in by his professor for one last conversation before he left the university. He'd finished all his exams. The professor called him in. He said, I'd like to have one more. Just chat before you leave. The student came in and he was feeling good. And the, the professor said, please sit down. Let's have a little chat. And he said, okay. And he said, tell me, um, tell me what are your plans from here? And the student said, well, I've got a job lined up. I'm, I'm excited about that. I'm, I'm, I've got a few weeks off and then I'm starting my new job. And the professor said, that's super. He said, uh, and then? He said, well, after that, I, I've got, I'm hoping to progress in that career and do well and, and get into management and uh, perhaps one day even have my own company. He said, oh, great. He said, and then? He said, well, I expect I'll get married because you know, I'd like to get married. Okay. And, and then his professor said, well, I don't know. I, I suppose we'll have children. I, I, I would like to have, that's a bit far ahead, but I, I would like to have children one day. And the professor said, super. Okay. So, and, and then? He said, well, I don't, I don't know. I hope to do well in my job and earn good money and put my children through a good education. And... Um, and, uh, and then I guess they'll leave home and themselves and get married and, and we'll be empty nesters. And uh, the professor said, so, yeah, good, okay. So, and then he said, well, 
He said, I, I suppose I I'll, I'll get to a certain age when I can retire and I can enjoy my retirement and I can, I can go and do all the things I didn't have time to do before when I was working a job full time. The professor said, that sounds very nice. He said, and, and then? And the chap said, well, I don't know. Our grandchildren will be doing some babysitting, I expect, and, and all that kind of stuff that grandparents apparently do. And, and uh, that'll be nice. And the professor said, and then? And the chap said, well, I suppose then? I'll die. And the professor said, and then? We can spend all our time and energy focusing on what's here and now and not prepare ourselves for the next life because this isn't all there is. Don't silence that nagging voice in your heart that says there's more to it than this. Don't, don't squish that, don't, don't press it down, don't distract yourself from that, that voice in your heart that's saying you need to pay attention to the spiritual side of your life. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, the Apostle Paul writes this, talking about his growth in his relationship with Jesus. I haven't already obtained all this, I have, I have not arrived at my goal, but I press on, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul knows that there is a prize waiting for him. And if he prepares well in this life, then he will enjoy it in the next. We have many good things lined up for us in this life, but many even better things in the next. And as we prepare in this life, we will be ready for what comes next. I'd like to encourage us to make sure that we prioritize that spiritual part of our lives that needs preparing, pressing on to find our purpose. And my one point today, and I really only have one point, and this is what I'd like to persuade you to do. So I'm telling you what I'd like you to do. This is what I would love you to do, whether you've got a lot of faith, a little bit of faith, whether you believe in Jesus or not, whether you have a, a, a religious background or not, whether you would count yourself a Christian or not, I, I have this one piece of advice to offer you that I believe, with all my heart, can transform your life, better your life in every conceivable way, if you'll just do this one thing. And that is to let Jesus be your mentor. Let Jesus be your mentor in this life. Who else would you rather have as a mentor? Who's greater than him? I was thinking about if I was in a football team and I was hoping to win the World Cup, who would I like to have a conversation with that's already, you know, that could really help me? And I thought of the pundits, I thought of Alan Shearer or Gary Neville or Lineker or some of those people. I thought it'd be interesting to talk about how to win the World Cup from them, but then I thought, no, I wouldn't want to talk to any of them, much as I respect them. I would want to talk to Pele. Yeah. Because I would want to talk to someone who won it, not someone who just put, took part. And isn't it the same with Jesus? We can talk to lots of people and read lots of books about what will make our lives better and there's some good stuff in there, but the only person who's lived this life to its fullest and is living the next life to its fullest is Jesus. He's, he's unique. There is no one to, with whom to compare him with. That's, that's, that's it. It's only him. And if we spend our lives getting all this other input and never, never finding out what Jesus has to say about this life and the next, we're missing out. Why miss out? I mean, that's, my, uh, that's what I want to urge us to, to think about today is, why miss out? Jesus isn't trying to give you a worse life or a worse next life. He wants you to have this life to its fullness and be prepared for what comes next. Why not let Jesus be your mentor? Why not read his teachings? Why not follow him a bit? Why not see what it would be like to allow him to speak into your life? Follow his 
thoughts and advice and see what it does for your life. I guarantee it will change your life if you let it. It will change it, and I believe, for the better. A few years ago, I sat down with a man called Marvin. Marvin knew that he was dying. He didn't have very long to live. I sat down with him and he didn't have any belief in God or anything like that. But I did sit with him and I asked him, are you interested? You know you're going to die soon, Marvin. He said, yes, I know. I said, are you interested in God? He said, no. I said, are you interested in the Bible? He said, no. I said, do you know what's going to happen when you die? He said, no. I said, would you like to know what will happen when you die? And he paused. And he said, yes. I said, well, how about if I could introduce you to the only person who's lived this life and has lived the next life and knows what's going to happen? If I introduced you to him, would you be interested? He said, yeah. I said, okay. To do that, we're going to have to look at the Bible. Because the only person I know who's done this is Jesus. He said, okay, you can read to me from your book. He didn't even, and he never read the Bible, it's just a book. I said, okay. And so we started talking about Jesus and how he loves us. And how he's come to make our lives full. Amen. And how he's come to prepare us for the next life. And how he's come to help us to win at life. And to win at the next life. Mm. And have victory that only he can provide. And he listened. Over a period of days and weeks, he listened. He was 73 years old, I believe. And finally, with all of his illness, he cl climbed into a baptistry and decided that Jesus was going to be his mentor, was going to be the one he was going to follow, and he became a Christian. Amen. And he won. He won the cup. He won what life is really all about. And I would wish that for every single one of us here today. Don't let the opportunity that Jesus presents you with pass you by as if it's of little consequence. Because this life comes round only once. This is not a rehearsal. Mm. This is the real thing. Mm. And we need to pay, pay attention to the spiritual component of our lives. Please, make Jesus your mentor. Mm. Thank you very much. I'll pray for the food, song, and then we get to go. Uh, dear Father God, thank you so much for this amazing day. Thanks for the great weather, God. Um, it's just so good to see our friends, family, and everybody here today, God. Thanks for the food. Um, thanks for all the guys who put in hard work to cook that salmon and those burgers and sausages, Father God. I pray they can nourish our bodies and that we can just have a fantastic day um, enjoying the sun and enjoying one another's friendships and communication and fellowship. Pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. There are some things
Enjoy the food, enjoy the fellowship, enjoy the sunshine.